Why the heck did you make this change? I'm not going to lie. There were some people in my life who were not 100% supportive. They were like, have you lost this freaking mind? So I was sitting here in my EVP role in my, my quote, quote, perfect life, right? And I'm like, I am miserable. I just was not happy. And I was really frustrated by the fact that I wasn't happy because I was like, come on, I've done it. I've done all the stuff. And so it forced me to like really do some soul searching and think about what do I really want my life to look like? I started to allow myself like and entertain the idea of like, what if I worked for myself, which was terrifying because so much of my self-worth was tied up in being an executive, right? Like I was like, if I'm not an executive, is anyone even gonna care about me? Hey friends, welcome to Right Off Track, your favorite entrepreneurial resource where we dive into the mindset, strategy, and purpose of entrepreneurs around the world who are sharing their real stories and insights with you. I believe that we all have a unique purpose in life and that embracing our unique and special journey will help uncover that. If this helps you on your journey, I so welcome your support as we grow and improve this channel. Join us, subscribe. I promise you I'm fully dedicated to making this work better every step of the way. So share your feedback, subscribe, share for a friend, and let's go on this adventure together right off track. Enjoy this episode. Going off track is taking a chance on yourself. Following your poles of curiosity. It's making your own decisions. The most wonderful adventure. Hey friends, I'm your host, Anya Smith, and today we're tackling an essential and timely topic, addressing the gender gap in leadership opportunities. We're delving into ways women can empower themselves to rise to any level they desire. Our discussion will focus on overcoming barriers, harnessing personal strengths, and paving a path for success in any leadership role, whether it's in the boardroom or the entrepreneurial field. With us is a powerhouse of knowledge and inspiration, a 40 under 40 winner, and a renowned international speaker, Katie McPhee. Katie's insights are geared towards empowering women to break through the glass ceiling and claim their rightful place in leadership. Welcome, Katie. Thrilled to have you here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. My absolute pleasure. And you were somebody that I saw on LinkedIn as I was starting my entrepreneurial journey. And it was just such a good role model for me, somebody who is sharing her truth, empowering other women. And I want to start off and ask, like, what are the biggest barriers we are seeing for women to, around this glass ceiling? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few. Um, there's what I call sort of external barriers, and then there's internal barriers. And, you know, external barriers can be things like bias, right? It's harder for women to get to those positions of leadership. Um, we don't have, we don't see women like us at the table, right? And so we don't have the, that same mentorship that a lot of our male counterparts do. Um, so those, those barriers do exist, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's our own internal barriers. And I think partly because we don't have that representation, because perhaps of the messaging we receive, you know, as we're coming up in our careers, oftentimes we struggle with confidence, we struggle with mindset, um, and something that I call the perception problem, hmm. where sometimes we feel we're ready for that next step. And for whatever reason, our leadership doesn't feel the same way. And so those are some internal things that we can really work on that can also hold us back. So it is, it's a complex problem and we kind of have to tackle it from both sides. Absolutely. And I looked at your website again, it was, it was amazing. It offers so many resources. And one thing you talk about is helping people with their executive presence. And I was mm. like, mm, what does that mean? Because I, I have a hunch that what I think it means is different from what it really means. So can you unravel like, what does executive presence really take? Yeah. Executive presence is one of those things that so many of us feel is like vague and elusive. Like, what is this thing? And really, it's the way you're showing up as a leader. I would say it's kind of like your personal brand of leadership. Yeah. And one thing that I do aim to do is demystify things like executive presence or strategic leadership mm -hmm. so that the women I work with can more easily overcome you know, these things. So, but really at the end of the day, executive presence is just like the traits and characteristics and behaviors mm -hmm. for how you're showing up as a leader. Absolutely. And if somebody is not in your course yet, could you divulge a little bit? What are those, uh, anything you feel comfortable sharing? What are some of those yeah. traits and any initial tips? Somebody's like, you know what? I am in that place where I'm ready for the next level, or I aspire to be that leader. What can I do where I'm at now? 
Yeah. So I go through the nine C's of executive presence. I've created like a list of nine. Um, I would, and I bucket them just to make it a little more digestible. I would say if I think of one category for someone to focus on, it would be communication style. Mm -hmm. And that means being clear and being concise and being credible in the way that you communicate. And so many women and men also uh, struggle with this, especially <laughs> conciseness. And the challenge is that when you, when you babble on, yeah, when you ramble or when, you know, when you take a thousand words to say something that could take a hundred, it can create the perception that you're not a big picture thinker, that you're not a strategic leader. And so if you were to focus on one area, I would say it should be that. It should be your communication style. Oh, beautiful. For somebody like me who definitely identifies that conciseness could be an area for improvement, any tips? Biggest tip would be prep, 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 prep. So when you Mm. don't prep, and I've observed this in everywhere from the boardroom to like wedding speeches. When you're going off the cuff, when you're trying to wing it, you tend to use a lot more verbiage than is what's really needed. If you take the time to prep, and I tell everyone, like every client, everyone I meet pretty much, I'm like carve out strategic thinking time during the week, carve out one to two hours where you can prep for important meetings, where you can think about how you can be having a bigger Mm -hmm. impact. And that will have a disproportionate impact on your results and on your career. So prepping for anything you're presenting, or even like ideas you have that you know, you want to bring to a meeting, spending some time really thinking about how do I want to frame this? Like, how do I want to share this? It'll, it'll be so, so impactful in terms of the way it comes off. Absolutely. And I know your focus is on helping directors, people at the high leadership role get to that next level. Mm. Yet, I believe all women, everybody should really work on their executive presence. Is there a point where it's too early to work on or is it any time would be helpful? Anytime. Oh my gosh. It's never too early. Um, Part of the reason I came up with a digital course was because there were some women earlier in their careers Mm -hmm. It didn't make sense for them to join my program yet, which is really geared towards like managers, senior managers and directors. And so I thought, okay, I need something that's just accessible to more people, Mm -hmm. which is why I created a digital course. So in my mind, if you know leadership is something that's that you want in your career, it's never too early to start thinking about showing up as a leader. And you don't have to be managing people to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad that this resource is evolving. And one thing you mentioned is like leadership branding. And for anybody that sees you now, you are like blowing up. You have all this different social content. You're creating these courses. You're on Instagram and on LinkedIn and so many places. And I'm curious, were you always aware of the power of branding as a leader? No. <laughs> so, it's funny because when I was an executive, I did not have an online presence. Mm-hmm. Other than, you know, the the obligatory, like I accepted a position as an EVP or, you know, <laughs> um, I I was aware of creating like a credible brand for myself. I was doing it a slightly different way, right? I was doing it through building my network and I was doing it through maybe uh, talking at events, like doing some speaker events. However, I had not yet invested in my online brand Mm -hmm. and I wish I had, you know, to anybody who's coming up, I think that it's such an important thing to invest in and the key reason, if you want to become a leader, if you want to become an executive, it builds credibility, right? Be really intentional about what stuff you're putting out into the world. And you can really position yourself as an expert. And that, again, it increases your credibility and people will see you as a leader that they want to work with. Absolutely. And do you have a strategy for somebody who's like, I'm already working so much. How the heck, Katie, do I start actually building a brand? That's an extra thing to add to my list. Yeah. I'm all about systems. I'm all about systems because for me, I mean, I don't have hours and hours a day to create content. It felt very daunting to me initially. And so what I did was I pre-write all of my posts. Mm -hmm. And so typically I have like a a month out written at a time because I get paranoid when it gets too close. (laughs) I I will block out time. I'm a big fan of deep work time and of work blocks. And so when I'm feeling creative, I'll write more than one post. I'll write a whole bunch of posts and then have those available. And then I use a scheduling tool because Mm -hmm. again, like I'm a mom, I have three boys, I have a busy life. I have a dog. There's so many things going on. 
And so I can't necessarily be on, let's say LinkedIn every morning at 840 to post. So I use a scheduling tool so I don't have to think about it. It's done. And then I'll go on and engage, but it takes the pressure off writing a post that day. I think too many people try to do it without a system and they think they had to (laughs) sit down at 830 in the morning and bang out a post. (laughs) Oh my gosh. My brain definitely couldn't do that. So I, I would say systematize it. Yeah. The other thing I would do is when I'd have good ideas for posts, I'd pop a note in my phone. And so when I sit down to write content, I have ideas to write about, mm-hmm. right? So um, creating the system around it, using tools to make your life a little bit easier, all yeah. things that I highly recommend. And like I said, I didn't, I didn't post my first post until I had 20 posts written because I thought, <laughs> hey, that's one every weekday for the next four weeks. Now I'm wow. ready to start. Yeah. Wow. And so what happened? So once you started posting, what what changed as you started building your brand for your leadership? It's so funny because initially I didn't plan to start posting until I launched my business. Mm-hmm. However, I had my 20 posts written. <laughs> so I thought like, <laughs> why not? I'll start posting. And it did a couple things. One thing it did was it really helped me to realize what I cared about if that makes sense. When I first launched my business, truthfully, yes, I wanted to work with women and help women transition to leadership, but I also figured I'll work with men too. I'll work with executive teams. I'll help companies with business strategy because this was all in my wheelhouse, right? I had been a senior executive. I had done business strategy. I'd done sales strategy, commercial strategy. However, as I started to write every day and post my ideas, I realized like what things got me really fired up. What did I really care about? And it was obvious to me very, very early in my, in my journey as an entrepreneur that I wanted to pivot my business to only focus on women, which a lot of people told me was a terrible idea. (laughs) (laughs) You're going to intentionally exclude the population. And I was like, yeah, you know, because these guys are fine. (laughs) Like they're getting there. And the first time, because I still had men contact me to work with me, the first time I said no, it was really hard, right? Mm-hmm. I was oh, oh. Like crazy. <laughs> but I knew like in my heart that this is what I was fired up about. So linked, writing on LinkedIn really helped me to figure that out. And then, of course, wow. the other thing it helped me to do was spread the word, right? It helped me to really expand my network, expand my reach. And so as a result, my business has really grown organically over the last couple of years. Yeah, it's... I've been so fortunate in that way that people have resonated with my content and then, and then clients just come find me. And once they do, like they kind of know what I'm about. Right. So once people come and contact me and want to work with me, they already know that, that I'm a fit for them because they've been reading my content sometimes for years. So yeah, it's been amazing in that way. Absolutely. And I've seen it opened up maybe opportunities for speaking and things like that. It, it builds that credibility to point. It creates a foundation for your stage. Like you're creating your stage with what you have. You know, funny you say that just this last Friday, I interviewed for my first TEDx talk. And just for context, um, some of you already know this listening, but I was laid off from Meta May, 2023. So I started this whole podcast, everything months ago. Um, but I was like, this is not going to hold me back. I'm going to go for every opportunity even though it's new and daring and somebody said it's too early, but I went for it. And when I created my TEDx talk, I reflected on what can I offer? And so I looked at myths of entrepreneurship. I looked into like, I created a framework because obviously you have to have a framework for how to start your entrepreneurial path. And although I'm still new at this, I could see that I have something to offer, but it took creating that, you know, 18 minute spiel getting concise, getting clear, seeing the value add from a different perspective. Like I know what I want to offer, but when you really take that time to your point, 20 posts for me, it was this realization. I was like, Oh, that makes it very clear. That makes it punchy. That gives it like that feel like this is what I'm going to focus on and not the million other things that I could be offering value to. So, um, I love that advice for others who are like, okay, maybe I should just start putting out there and reflect on what resonates. Yeah. Because you know, writing has an amazing way of, of helping you to formulate your ideas. Yeah. Right. And so it'll, yeah. it'll help you become a better speaker. It'll help you to think better on your feet. Like, I just think there's so yeah. many benefits to writing. Absolutely. And one post that I saw you write about, um, talks about burnout. So you frequently talk about how you work for an entrepreneur, crazy hours, weekday hours, and you don't work on the weekend unless it's something you look like, whoa, <laughs> Yeah. Entrepreneur goals right there. Can you talk about how 
How did you set out those boundaries for yourself? Yeah. Yeah. That was, um, I think that was one of my first posts that went like crazy viral was the one about my, my work rules. So the reason I created these was because when I was an executive, before I started as an entrepreneur, I did burn out, right? I, I went through a burnout event in my life. And I always tell people, if you haven't been through burnout, it's not something you can fix with a week in Mexico. It's no joke, right? It takes months and months and sometimes like a year. I think it was a year before I was feeling back to myself. And so going into my entrepreneurial journey, I knew already I'm not willing to do the grind. Like I am willing to work hard. I'm willing to be super efficient. And like during the hours I work, I'm going to be heads down, all in deep work. But I'm not willing to be like one of those founders who post online about like, I didn't eat all day yesterday and I work 18 hour days. I'm like, I'm not willing to do it. Like, I'm going to actually create the challenge for myself. I'm going to build a successful business with balance in my life where I can go hiking on Fridays and I can, you know, spend the morning with my kids and I can do my routine and all of that stuff. So yeah, it was my own burnout event, honestly, that I'm like, I'm never going back there. I'm never going to do it to myself again. And I never did. And truthfully, like when you're in the grind and you're working all the time and, you know, you wake up and the first thing you do is check Slack and check email and, you know, it's like coffee to wake you up and wine to help you go to sleep. When you're in that life, it's hard to picture another way of living. Yeah. But now that I'm on the other side of it, I would never go back. I am like in love with my life. I'm in love with like how I get to spend every day. And I love working on my business. But yeah, my business is designed around my life and not the opposite. Oh, amen to that. And that's also one thing that really resonated with me is I'm also a mom with three boys. Uh, one, four, and I'm a stepmom to our 11-year-old. So like, ah. And I love the idea that we are, we are setting healthy boundaries for ourselves. And can you share, besides the mindset, besides saying like, I know what that looks like. I'm not going there. Were there other things that you implemented or regularly implement your systems to help you maintain those boundaries? Absolutely. I'm all about the systems, by the way. <laughs> um, I don't like to rely on my brain for anything. So <laughs> it's like, it's like I don't have so, I'm big on work blocks. Like everything is in my calendar and I color code my calendar. So I know like clients. I know strategy time. I know like everything that I'm working on, speaking engagements, everything is color coded in my calendar. So I can look at it at a glance and make sure it makes sense. But I do my deep work blocks. My phone is on focus all day long. And my friends and my partner find this a little annoying because they're like, I texted you and you know, you don't get back, you don't pick up your phone. But it's because when I'm working, I am like all in, right? I think this is really important because you know, I remember when I was a leader, I would look around at, at some of the people that worked for me. They never seemed to have enough time in the day, but every time I looked at them, they were on their phone on social media and it's not their fault, right? Like it's so addictive and it's very easy to get sucked into that, but these add up, right? There's the switching costs. And I think it's like, what is it like 22 minutes or something it takes to come back? Huge, huge. It's a long time. And so I've just cut that out, right? Like I'm super efficient when I work. Like I said, I, I time block. So I'm working on one thing at a time and I've got like my deep work time and then my more tactical like email checky type time. Um, but my phone's on focus all day. So when I am working, I'm not distracted. Um, I also go for a walk and eat a proper lunch every day. So when I come back after lunch, I'm like reset. I'm good to go. My brain's firing again. And so I'm just very systematic in that way. Like very routine, very systematic. Um, and that's really allowed me to maintain those boundaries because when I finish work at the end of the day, I've actually gotten a lot done. I don't need to work more, you know, in, in that particular day. Um, I also, like, I set hard rules for myself. So I don't take clients, for example, in, on the e in the evenings. A lot of coaches coach in the evenings. I don't. I don't. Clients on Fridays or Mondays. And I obviously not on the weekends as well. And that's, I'm in the minority, right, for a lot yeah. of people in the coaching space. Um, but again, for me, hard rules work because then I don't have to ask myself, like, should I take one more evening client or should I let this person book with me on a Saturday? There's just no option to. 
And so that makes it really easy. It's beautiful. Again, having that system. I actually, I love systems. So to mm-hmm. me, it's like talk systems to me. And I love it. Um, and I remember distinctly, I reached out to you months ago and you told me you responded a, which is amazing. And you said, Anya, I am prioritizing this right now. Mm-hmm. And you're like, Hey, hey actually first, yes, me show me the numbers. So I was like, I love that. This is awesome. Um, and that also reminds me how one thing I've cultivated is I realize as a new entrepreneur, especially somebody creating content, one thing that sucks my attention checking the stats, right? Mm -hmm. You're like social, how many people like this, you know? Um, And so I've recently implemented Screen Zen. It's an app that you can set limits on how often you check something. And that's been really helpful. And just realizing, to example, that we need space. Mm -hmm. There's this misconception that we need to work harder to get farther ahead. We need to do more versus realizing that space gives us reflection, Mm -hmm. gives us a time to recuperate and regain our skills regain our energy so we can show up better and actually prioritize what we need to prioritize by giving us that reflection space. Yes. Yeah. And you know, when it comes to say social media, I think it's just so important too to like check in with yourself and in your, and your body. And I noticed that like there are certain apps that I would check and I would like, I would feel Mm. anxious after. And so I just decided I'm just not going to do that. Right. And so I, I'm actually pretty good. I kind of detach from social media. I, I post there every day <laughs> and I do engage with people in yes. an intentional way, but I don't spend a ton of time obsessing over my stats or obsessing over, you know, the numbers of this person got more likes than me or whatever. I really do kind of detach from it, which has mm-hmm. been so helpful for me. And it's always kind of funny to me when I meet someone in real life and they say, Oh, I love your LinkedIn posts. Cause like I'm like, Oh, like you're a real human and you read because <laughs> in my mind, it's like yeah. just kind of two different worlds. Like I write things yeah. and then I have my life. <laughs> They're like, oh, I keep beautiful. it separate, which for me works well. That's beautiful. What motivates you then? What motivates so you're you? Not, yeah. It's not vanity matrix, matrix obviously yeah. you have your boundaries, you have that, but what is keeping that drive alive oh, then? Such a good question because So for me, I always like to think about that. Like what really matters? What am I actually trying to accomplish here? And if let's say for LinkedIn, I want to have impact, right? I want to help women and I want to get clients. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be famous. I'm not trying to be like, have Ah. most followers (laughs) on LinkedIn, right? If I was, I'd probably be posting different types of of content because my content's, for a specific type of person, not everyone yeah. is going to find value in it. And so I'm really intentional about reminding myself of that. And one of my yeah. affirmations or intentions for this year is to always be reminded of what truly matters. And so when yeah. I think of what truly matters, okay, I want to help women. I want to mm-hmm. impact women's lives and careers. I want to help narrow the gender gap in senior leadership through what I share, you know, the speaking that I do, the women I help. But then I also want to have a life that I love and I want to spend time being active in nature and I want to spend time with my family. And that also really matters to me. So I think yeah. maintaining that perspective really helps you to realize that like, oh, this this post bombed. Who cares? I'll just not right. post it again. And Katie, can I ask you a provocative question? Yeah. How do you feel about authenticity in leadership? Because one thing that I'm really passionate about on this topic is being authentic and embracing your unique journey, whatever that looks like, but not setting like not letting the social convention say like you need to be successful and you need to be happy in XYZ format. And I can imagine that in certain leadership levels, being authentic and being a leader can be challenging mm. because of the sense of like what you should do to fit in that surrounding. How do you perceive leadership that in these kind of settings? Excuse me, authenticity yeah. in these settings. Yeah, to me, I think it is so important. To be authentic, to be your full authentic self as a leader. Yeah. Because when you stop doing that, yeah. you like feel it, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, you feel it in the way you're showing up. You feel it in, you know, your your satisfaction, your job satisfaction, and how happy you are in your life. Mm-hmm. And it's been it was an interesting journey for me because I came up in, you know, male-dominated fields, which sounds like you did too, right? And leadership, especially, was very much male-dominated. And I've posted about this before where I kind of like adapted to 
the environment I was in, where I was like one of the dudes. I was like down, like, let's go have drinks. Like, I'll smoke a cigar, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and, and this was subconscious. I wasn't intentionally doing this. I just wasn't really thinking about it, right? I was just fitting yeah. in and I wanted to be fun. And I realized at a certain point in my career that I wasn't actually showing up as my full authentic self. I was sometimes, right? But right. there were certainly times that I wasn't. And once I saw that, it's like I couldn't unsee it. And after that, I was like, I'm never going to do that, right? Like, it's yeah. up to me, one, to show up as my full authentic self for me, but also for the women around me and the women who are coming up, right? I'm going to be the person who's going to say like, oh, like maybe we don't want to like go to a hockey game for the team <laughs> event, right? Like <laughs> be the voice of like, you know, of the other side. Um, so yeah, so it was a kind of an interesting journey for me because I do feel it's so mm -hmm. important. And it's one of those things that as I started to lean into that and really become intentional and aware, I, I felt so strongly about the importance mm -hmm. of that. But can I say I did it 100% my whole career? No, I did it. Yeah. And I think that's why maybe that's why I feel so strongly about it now. Yeah. And one thing that just sparked my mind, one really important topic you talk about is negotiation, negotiating offers. Um, but maybe even more generally, whether you're an entrepreneur, all, you're always going to be negotiating with your clients. What tips do you have for negotiating and like doing it in a way that's not combative, but yeah. in a confident, like, I know what I'm worth kind of way. Yes. You know what? I have a free, free guide um, on negotiation. So I can, we can put in the show notes if you want, because let's do it that for free or they can get off my Perfect. website. Perfect. On my website, actually. I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll put it in the show. <laughs> we'll notes. find it and link it. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I, I have a framework that I've created for negotiation. Mm -hmm. so there are three elements to it. First one is do your homework, mm -hmm. right? Because when you, when you lead with objective data, mm -hmm. your argument is so much more compelling. So I'm like, lean on that objective data, do your homework, whether it's a salary negotiation or you want a promotion or whatever the thing is, right? There's, yeah. there's work that you can do that's going to really set you up for success. The second is um, frame it right. So be very aware of language, of how you are making your ask. And then the third is the timing. And mm -hmm. That's going to differ depending on the negotiation. Whenever you're coming into a new job, I always say, wait till they are in love with you, <laughs> right? Like wait till they really <laughs> want you. They're unlikely to want to lose their ideal candidate over a few thousand dollars. Um, right. And so that timing will, will be different depending on what you're negotiating, what the circumstances are, but just those are three things that you can consider when you have to negotiate something. Absolutely. And I read that post, I think it was in the recent newsletter, you were talking about 2024 um, and kind of setting the price right for you. And what I th thought about that for entrepreneurs, it could also be about, hey, you have a service maybe like others and you can research and say, hey, here is my price point based on objective comparison on what this, what this range is and what value I'm adding, right? Mm. What you talked about using we language. So you're saying, here is how we are working towards this goal together. And here is how my service is helping you align if you are goals. And so I definitely think a lot of that carryover. So everything you see will help you as a leader, as a female leader, no matter if you are growing um, in the corporate world and decide to go outside, like wherever you are, this is going to be helpful um, on your journey. And I wanted to pivot if that's okay and talk about your journey. Mm -hmm. So you were mentioning here, you were a director and you had this challenge, honestly, getting to the next level. Can you talk about like, what did you undergo through that challenge trying to get to that next level in your leadership? Yeah. So I was a director, I think for five years, almost to the day, trying to get to that next level. I was um, the only female also on my leadership team. And, you know, it was one of those things where I'd never had a female mentor and I didn't have one mm -hmm. at that point either. Uh, I did not know what I was doing wrong. Like I just had so many <laughs> blind spots and yeah. I was looking for resources to help me understand what I needed to do to get that next level. And I, I was really struggling to find those um, because I was somebody who was like very goal oriented, very career driven, and I was not afraid to do the hard work. Right. So I was like reading business books. I worked with an executive coach. Like I did so many things to try to get to that next level. And, and finally I did, which was really years of learning, right. It was years of, you know, 
learning from my mistakes, reflecting on what had gone well, what hadn't gone well, and and really growing in my role. And the thing that I realized eventually was this company is never going to make me a VP. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. I realized that if I if this was important to me, if this was a, an important part of my career journey that meant something, I was going to have to go do it somewhere else. And mm-hmm. It was a hard decision, but I made that decision. I ended up moving to another company. I did get a VP position. Um, and you know what? It it went really well. Like I killed it, right? So <laughs> it was it was interesting, you know, in retrospect, because for the longest time I was doubting myself and I'm like, maybe I'm not even cut out for this. And then I got there and I was like, oh, this is it. So this is part of the reason that I feel so strongly about teaching other women what you can do to to demonstrate that you're ready for that next level because I myself struggled with it so much for a lot of years and I didn't have somebody to give me that advice. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, then I went and became an EVP and then I decided to become an entrepreneur. So then I was starting all over again, right? Like just not knowing, not knowing a lot that I had to learn on this journey. So going back to that beginner's mindset, but it's all been really fun and so worth it. Absolutely. And you know what it reminds me of is that oftentimes we, when we're not succeeding, we can either, um, you know, blame or we doubt ourselves. And mm-hmm. neither of them is helpful, although it's, they're natural. And the blame is like, oh, this is, it's because of XYZ, because of this company, whatnot. Uh, but sometimes we have to also realize like, hey, there's room for growth for us. And then once we get to a certain level like where, hey, you know, I've done my work, we should also be discerning about is the surrounding working for us? So yeah. it's not always about us lacking. It's not that there's a, you know, every place is going to be perfect for us. This is a misconception. Like if I'm not doing great here, then it's like, oh, I'm not going to do great anywhere. There's, you know, the, the, the fertile soil feeds the seed. And sometimes the soil is just not fertile for you in that situation. Yeah. And I love that you were the, use the word discerning because one mm-hmm. thing I say a lot with my clients is, you know, be discerning, but not mm-hmm. judgmental. Right. right. So move from that like judgment to discernment where you can be honest with yourself. Am I showing up as my best self? Have I done the best job I could? That's the discernment part, but leave yeah. the judgment behind, which might mean me judging right. ourselves. It might mean judging others. It might be judging circumstances. And to your point, like it's not, it's not helpful to do that. Absolutely. And now the exciting part, the part I'm, I'm really looking forward to is here you are an EVP, like at the top of your game and you do something absolutely crazy you you pivot to an unknown territory yeah. why the heck did you make this this change i know i know and some i'm not going to lie there were some people in my life who were not 100% supportive they were like have you lost your freaking <laughs> mind <laughs> um, so i mean i i mentioned to you that i was burnt out so that was a that was a contributing yeah. factor it wasn't the the whole thing but a big element of that burnout was that i was no longer feeling aligned Hmm. And as, as some of us know now, you know, burnout isn't just about working long hours. It's about alignment with what you're doing. Hmm. And, you know, I had earlier in my career, I'd worked in biotech. I'd worked in a space where like we were literally saving people's lives with the technologies we were bringing to market. We were advancing science. We we're doing amazing things. And I felt so attached to the mission. And then I started to like, really be focused on my external title and getting to the VP suite and like all of that stuff. And that was more of my focus, right? And so I took some opportunities that I don't regret in retrospect at all. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was moving further and further away from like what I was really aligned with and what I was really passionate Mm -hmm. about. And so I was sitting here in my EVP role in my, you know, my quote, quote, perfect life, right? I had bought this house and it was beautiful and I had a baby and you know, my partner and I had this great big fancy job and I'm like, I am miserable. Like, I just thought like, I just was not happy. And I was really, you know, frustrated by the fact that I wasn't happy because I was like, come on, (laughs) I've done it. I've done all the stuff. And so it forced me to like really do some soul searching and think about what do I really want my life to look like? Like if I could like wave a magic wand and and create my perfect life, what would it really look like? And I I started to allow myself like and entertain the idea of like, what if I worked for myself, which was terrifying because so much of my self-worth was tied up in being 
uh, an executive, right? Like I was like, if I'm not an executive, is anyone even going to care about me? Like, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point of me? Right. Right. And so in that, I had to get over some stuff there, mm-hmm. right? And just be like, you know what? I won't be an executive, but like, there's other things that I can do that will matter. I can help people and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, But it was a really scary decision. I'm not going to lie. It was really scary. It took me a little bit of time to like work through that. But a big part of what created the change that like actually allowed me to take action and pivot was the visualization, right? Was Mm -hmm. me saying, okay, I'm going to entertain this. I'm going to just allow myself to be like, what would my perfect day look like if if I, there was no constraints, if I was doing whatever I wanted to do. And the truth mm-hmm. is that day looked like working for myself and having space, more space in my life and mm-hmm. more time with friends and more focus on health and that kind of thing. So, and here you are, you're making yeah, it happen. Yeah. <laughs> here I am. For anybody who is maybe reaching that point where in their soul, they're feeling some lack do you have any advice about how to reflect on like how to get over that and take the next step in the right direction? Yeah, I did a few things. So one thing I did was I looked at where I was and mm-hmm. I looked at what I was doing and I wrote down everything I did as part of my job. And I put it in two columns. One was energizes me and one was drains mm-hmm. my energy. And you can do this for any part of your life right? I was doing it for my job, but you can think about your life. I do this at the end of the year as part of my annual reflection, what things drained my energy, what things gave me energy. And that exercise was eye-opening because the drains my energy Mm -hmm. column was really long. (laughs) (laughs) So that that was one thing I did. Um, And like I said, the second one was really the visualization of like, what does the biggest, boldest vision of my life look like? Like every area, right? So health, wealth, relationships, career, think about all these areas of your life. What does the biggest, boldest vision of your life look like? And then like, where are you today? And what is that gap? And oftentimes, like we know what we want, right? Like oftentimes we know in the back of our minds, like we've been shoving it down, right? We've been ignoring the whispers for years, but typically we know in our heart what we really want. And so it's more just giving yourself permission to like write it down or say it out loud and, and actually dream a little mm-hmm. and, and think about like, okay, could I put together a plan to actually make this happen? Oh, that's beautiful. Again, you have the strategies that's clearly in your head. So I love this advice for wherever you are, having that space for reflection and honoring that intuition. Mm-hmm. We, we, we forget it along the, among the hustle and bustle, we forget about the intuition Yes. That there is inner wisdom, there's inner guidance that we often shove down, but it's there waiting for you to give it space. And as you're helping these leaders grow into their, you know, perceived, you know, title and whatnot, how do you help them keep that alignment? You said it's so important. Yeah. I mean, we talk about it a lot, right? Yeah. Even, even when we're talking about a situation, like how to manage a certain situation, I always bring it back to like, does this feel authentic to you? Right. So we talk about authenticity. I work with all of my clients, both in the group and Mm one-on-one with a life vision tool, because I think it is so game changing and pivotal to, to go through that exercise. So all of my clients have an opportunity to do that. Um, And then we just bring it back, right? Like the life vision tool also comes up, like you come up with your vision and then you come up with your big milestone goals and your next best Mm -hmm. steps. And so there are things to do, you know, right away to to keep you on track. Um, But when they're stuck in a decision, I'll often say, like, how does this align with your life vision? They'll be like, oh, Oh. it's the opposite. Okay. (laughs) So again, my clients know we we all have the inner wisdom, right? You just having someone there to remind you or to hold space for you while you remind yourself can be really powerful. Absolutely. I love that. That, that. that powerful question, like how does this align to your life vision? It's, it, it cuts all the, all the ex- extent, all the non-essential You're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Get to the core from there. Um, I'm also curious if we both mentioned we're moms mm. and we have three boys, which is an incredible undertaking on its own. How has this leadership journey and the entrepreneurial journey shaped you as a mom and influenced your kids? Yeah. You know what? It's, it's really cool. I mean, my kids see me as 
a successful career person. It's funny because for one of my kids, for he's my eldest is 13. And for a school thing, he had to Google their parents. And he's like, mom, you're all over the internet. Wow. That's so <laughs> cool. I know, buddy. I know. Your mom does some stuff. Like my kids just see me as their mom, right? But but I yes. but I have ingrained in them, like their whole life, they've seen that like I traveled for work and I do things I care about and I'm passionate. And I think that's really good for them for a couple of reasons. Mm-hmm. One, our home is very um, balanced in the sense that mm-hmm. like my partner preps dinner lots of nights and he puts our toddler to bed more often than I do. And like, mm-hmm. you know, we we have a really healthy balance that I I love that my kids get to observe because I didn't really see that as much growing up. Right. My mom was the primary, you know, caregiver and my, my dad was the primary breadwinner. And, uh, and so I didn't necessarily have that example in my own life. And so I love that my boys are going to see that. And I love it because they're boys, because I think that in terms of the next generation, yes, we need to empower our little girls. Yes. We need to teach them to be bold, but we also need to teach boys to lift women up and teach boys that women are equal and, and all of that kind of stuff. And so um, I feel that my kids are getting to, to observe that. And I mean, Hey, I like to talk about what I do. And so <laughs> when I, whenever given the chance, I'm talking to them about it and why it matters. They're still young, but I'm like, yes. I'm planting those seeds with them, right? Why it matters yeah. and why, why girls can do everything that boys can do. Absolutely. I, I have three boys and I honestly was a little bit sad that we didn't have a girl, you know, there's always that like ugh, something different. And I'm so grateful that they're amazing. And I see this responsibility that we get to shape these men mm-hmm. who can see strong women and honor that independence and look for that in their partner yeah. and see that that's normal. And I'm curious for any parent mom that feels this doubt and feels like it's selfish for them to go after that, go after their title, go after their entrepreneurship, what advice would you give them? Yeah, it's so funny because I I used to carry a bit of guilt. I'm not going to lie. When because especially yeah. in the corporate yeah. world, I was really working towards this goal. I traveled a lot. I worked a lot, and I I carried some guilt. Like, did I miss too much of their childhood? I also my two older boys are from a previous marriage, so right. that I also got divorced, and so I carried some guilt about that. And I remember asking them. It must have been like last summer because they were they were like old enough. They were like maybe. Right now they're 10 and 13. It might've been this year. It might've been last year. And I said, I was driving them somewhere and I'm like, guys, do you think I missed too much of your childhood? Aww. <laughs> and they were like, what are you talking about, mom? Like, I don't think you missed any of it. Like, <laughs> like we did this trip. We've done that. We've done this. Like to them, they never even noticed. And so that was yeah. like hugely eye-opening to me where I was carrying around all of this guilt and my kids had no idea, right? <laughs> They're like, we didn't remember having movie night. Like they didn't know if I was working or what. So um, my advice would be give yourself some grace, right? Give yourself some grace because our life doesn't end when we have kids. We need our own goals. We need our own dreams. And I think that we can be that example. Like our kids can see us working on things that we care about. They can see us living out our passion. And there's so much benefit in that. So as so long as you're, you know, that balance exists, I still feel like, I still get quality time with my kids. Um, But I think that like being easy on ourselves is, is the path is, is a good idea. And I saw a stat, actually, I read this years ago, so I'm probably going to butcher it, but it was (laughs) something like working moms today spend more time daily with their kids than stay at home moms did in the seventies. Wow. And it's because we are so focused. Like we want that quality time with them. We want it. We want that interaction. And so if you think about how much pressure we're putting on ourselves as full-time working moms, when, you know, when we were just decades ago, when we were just home with our kids, we were on the phone with our friends or we were watching our soap operas or whatever, and we weren't feeling bad about it. So I think that some of this guilt is, is new and it's, it's in line with the fact that we work more. But I think, uh, I think when we just look at how it's impacting our kids, they're okay. That's beautiful. My coach and I talked about it and I was expressing how I feel guilty sometimes that I'm working. And she was saying, well, how would you show up differently? So say if you, either you're busy, you know, and you're showing up when you are distracted and whatnot, like how are you showing up for your children when you show up, but you're not fully present or you feel like not quite fulfilled or you feel stressed or resentful. 
sometimes I honestly felt resentful by kids and I didn't realize it because I was thinking, well, I can't do X, Y, Z because I'm a mom of a toddler, of a child. And I realized like, that's BS. That's all in my head. And when I'm going for it, yes, I have times when I'm working, but when I'm showing up, I'm not resentful. I am checking mm-hmm. in myself like that. They're not holding me back. And yeah. when I'm there, I am fully present. So that's what helped me is that realizing, hey, I can either be always with them, right? But not feel fulfilled and show up in a certain way, or I honor my growth. And when I am there, I'm showing up as like my full self, happy, energized, like living my fullest. So I think that's a beauty too, is like realizing how do you show up taking each path? I love that so much because I've said so many times, like I I would not be a good mom if I was a stay-at-home mom. Like I just, I need my creative outlets. I need to, I need this stuff really fulfills me. And so instead of feeling guilty about that, I'm going to have my career. And when I'm with my kids, I'm just going to be all in with my kids, right? I'm going to be fully present with them. And I, I hear you so much because the times that I felt frustrated with my kids is because I'm trying to do something else. And when I was an executive, I was a very distracted executive. I'd be like on my yeah. phone, trying to approve yeah. things while while I'm trying to parent my kids or, you know, whatever. And that's when I would get frustrated with them or I'd lose my patience. And I realized like, that's not on them. That's on me, right? Like it's up to me to say, okay, I'm going to take this time and work. And then when I'm present with the kids, I'm just going to be present with them. So I made that when I first launched my business, I made that an intention. I'm going to be present. I call it an aligned choice. It was a aligned choice. Beautiful. I'm going to be present. With, if I'm with my clients, I'm with my clients. If I'm with my kids, I'm with my kids. If I'm with my partner, I'm with my partner. But I'm going to be somebody who's present in my life. And it was a decision I made. And woof, it was, it's been so game changing for like how I show up in the world. Oh, beautiful. Here we are. I'm so, I'm so genuinely excited about this conversation because it's challenging stereotypes in so many ways of what it means to be an entrepreneur of how you can be a leader as a, as a woman and how you can be a mom and an entrepreneur and doing it without burnout, without quote unquote sacrifice, without like ruining your mom. I don't know, uh, perception of who you are as a mom, whatever that means. I just love that. And everybody listening, if, even if you're not a mom, if you're a dad, if you're a single person, like, I just want you to hear that you can have that balance. You can have those systems. You can have those boundaries and align them with your life vision. And create that reflection space and slow down in a very powerful way Mm -hmm. um, so that you are serving yourself in a very, um, in the best way possible, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. It's like, we think we have to choose, but I'm the one that's like, you don't have to choose. I really don't feel that you do. I think that that's a limitation we put on ourselves or it's like career or family or passions or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you're really intentional about the way you design your life. And I mean, I don't watch a lot of TV, okay? <laughs> so, me neither. Me I neither. Do all the other stuff. <laughs> Something's yeah. got to give. But if yeah. you're really intentional with the way you design your life, you can have that. I'm going to call it balance, but I mean, it's work life blend. It's it's balance, whatever you want to call it. But to me, it's designing your life in an intentional way. Beautiful. Yeah, we are not just uh, we're not we're not in for the ride. Like we have agency in our life, and we can yeah. decide how we show up and what we want to live. And Katie, this has been amazing. You just said that you had an exercise where you reflected on what energizes and what doesn't. What is energizing you in 2024? What goals are you setting for yourself? And what can you look forward to as your audience in this year? Oh, great question. One of my intentions for this year is doing more of what I love in my business. So mm-hmm. that's going to be probably more speaking, hopefully more in-person speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, some more podcasts. Podcasts are fun too. Um, and more writing. I really love writing. And I'm, I'm thinking about what is next in my writing journey and like coming up with some plans there, but um, it's still really early. But this year compared to previous years of my business, I am going to be doing more of that kind of creative work of writing and speaking um, and really leaning into that because I've realized it really energizes me. I love it. And yeah. I was kind of doing it as like a like a side you know, a side thing in my business. Yeah. And I realized I wanted to be more front and center. So that's what's coming yeah. for 2024. Um, and then more of what I've been doing as well. Like, you know, I post on LinkedIn every single day. I actually, I love that platform. I get to share. 
a little longer form than some other platforms, right? So yeah. you get to share some some quality content. Um, so I'll be doing that. And I launched a LinkedIn newsletter as well recently. So yeah, there's lots of, of free content that people can find from me. And what's in the newsletter? Uh, so I, it's typically going to be bi-weekly. I did it monthly for the month of January because I had a theme, um, but it's everything, right? Like I, I, yeah. I talk about, you know, leveling up, getting to leadership, thriving as a leader, but also thriving in your life. So entrepreneurs yeah. could get something out of it too. Um, yeah. you know, I talk about creating that balance. I talk about not having to choose and not burning out. And so, and sometimes I even talk about like my daily routine and health and that kind of stuff. So <laughs> Kind of Beautiful. all all of the elements of success, I would say, go into my newsletter. And it's called the seat at the table. Is that right? Yeah. So the LinkedIn version is called the seat at the table. You can also get it right to your email inbox. Yeah. Not everyone wants to get it to their LinkedIn inbox. Um, so they can also sign up on my website and they can just get it right to their regular email inbox every two weeks. Yeah. Um, oh. yeah so either one of those. And the one on my, um, I think it's called Monthly Insights. Even though it's now bi-weekly, I got to change the name. It's been called monthly news for like a year and a half, and it's been a bi-weekly newsletter for a year. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Priorities. Well, Katie, you've been amazing. Here, right after we wrap up for three rapid fire questions. So whenever you're ready, let me know. Let's do it. Let's see, who has been your biggest role model in your journey? So I would say I haven't had a single role model in mm -hmm. my journey. Um, there are some women that I really look up to, right? Like years ago, I read Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. I was really inspired by that. Somebody who I love, love is uh, Reshma Sojani. Everything mm -hmm. she posts and talks about in terms of like helping women. I just bought like all of her books. Yeah. And so I have, there's a lot of people that I, that I follow and listen to. I really like um, Sahil Bloom, even mm -hmm. though he's a dude. Yeah. I just love yeah. his content. I really like Ryan Holiday. So like there's all those types of people. I follow their content a lot um, and I'm, I'm really inspired by it. But yeah, I, I haven't had one single role model. I kind of draw my yeah. inspiration from a lot of different people. That's beautiful. I love that. Okay. What's a common myth about women in leadership that you like to debunk? I would say that women in leadership are like hard or I want to say the B word, right? But like, yeah, <laughs> sure yeah. I'm allowed to on this. <sighs> yeah. I, I do think that there is, um, there is a feeling that like a lot of women in leadership don't want to help other women. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's through people's personal experience. Maybe there was like a, you know, they had a female boss that, that didn't support them. Um, but I do think that there's a little bit of a myth there that like, the women that actually make it to the top are these like hard asses who, who, you know, don't want to lift up the women around them. And I don't actually find yeah. that to be true 99% of the time. I find most of the women that I meet in leadership are like amazing, uh -huh. talented, you know, powerhouse uh, souls that really want to lift up the women around them as well. Oh, so powerful. I am so glad we asked that question and you shared that. So everybody take that to heart, challenge those myths. And last but not least, in the positive sense, going off track is? Going off track is carving your own path to me, right? It's like off track could just mean off the beaten path and it's finding what's right for you and just going for it. Oh, beautiful. Katie, you were incredible. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for inspiring us to have boundaries, to challenge burnout, to challenge myths about leadership and women in leadership, and for also giving us all these strategies and tips and advice daily on LinkedIn and other places. I'm just so grateful for this interview. And everybody listening, like reflect on what is your life journey? What is your life mission? What are your priorities and boundaries? And let's make 2024 the most amazing year yet. And as always, let's take over the world together right off track. Until next time, take care, Katie. Thank you so much. Thank you.